Welcome to the newest edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. John Schmoke with you today. We're joined by a couple of all-time great Giants kickers, Lawrence Tynes and Jeff Fiegels. But first, as a reminder, you can find the Giants Huddle Podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms at Giants.com slash podcast and on the Giants mobile app. Now we're joined by Lawrence Tynes and Jeff Fiegels. LT, man, how are you, dude? Guys, what's going on? This is this is fun. I've been looking forward to this since you asked me last week. So good to see everybody. Now, Good everyone knows about your Giants credentials, Lawrence, but I know you're also doing – you've entered the podcast world yourself here. Tell the folks about what you're doing with uh, Paul Schwartz and the guys over at the New York Post. Yeah, so me, Jake Brown, Sarah McCrory, and Paul Schwartz are hosting a podcast called Blue Rush by the New York Post twice a week. So, you know, we break down the Giants games. We give a preview on Thursdays. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's kept me close to the Giants, obviously. I would have watched them anyway, but, you know, getting paid to talk about them is not a bad thing. So – um, I love the Giants. I love the NFL. And, you know, we got a good team. It's a lot of fun. We keep it loose. We have a lot of good guests. Jeff has been a guest before. Um, so it's a good show. I enjoy doing it. Now, Jeff, we always give you a hard time about being a kicker. Do you feel like empowered now that you kickers outnumber nine kickers two to one here? Of course. Yeah. Well, no matter what the numbers always look like, we always outnumber everybody in our own minds. So it doesn't matter. But, but, that's, Tynesy, right. that's uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely, out you're outnumbered today so you better behave yourself we'll jump right through this come on smoky all right well let's get into it i don't want to spend too much time on the raider game specifically but this is airing only a few days after that game is over so tinesy give me your take on how the giants came out and, and won that game against las vegas on sunday probably the second best win of the year after that game in new orleans i would agree with that and, and you know you never apologize for winning in the nfl um it was ugly offensively they did what they had to do uh, defensively gave up a lot of yards, but they didn't let them convert in the red zone. Um, I, I would never apologize for that win. I, I said it was a very, very good win because of the COVID issues, the injuries, the things they had, no practices. You know, Jason Garrett kind of hodgepodge the game plan with the tight ends and the running back. And you got to give a lot of credit to the offensive line and Booker. They played really well. People are, you know, as you know, on social media with all the outside targets, the receivers didn't get many targets, but to be able to beat a very good Raiders team before you go into the bye and then you get some guys back, I mean, that's a big, that's as big as win as they'll have all season. So I was impressed with it. Um, the numbers be damned, but um, good win for the Giants, you know, heading into a bye. I agree with you, LT. That's everything that you said was, uh, I, I tell you, you know, here's the thing about the Raiders. They're, uh, they were in first place coming into that game and a lot of times we talk about and Lawrence you know about this traveling across the country for for a few years now I don't think there's been a lot of effect with that I think that affected this team on Sunday uh the Raiders coming across they were on a buy also which I know times, I, yeah. and by the way their records off coming off buys were they're horrible so uh and that continues for the Raiders but um you know they had their own set of circumstances to deal with as far yeah. as uh, Henry Ruggs and some things going mm -hmm. like that but as far as Derek Carr goes, a guy who was playing very well, who's done not turning over the ball. He did a lot of that this weekend. And also the red zone for the defense for the Giants was outstanding. And by the way, I think this is the way the Giants thought that their defense would play from the beginning of the season. And there was a little blip in the radar. So if you can get this defense to play like they did this last week in the last three weeks, good things are going to happen for the Giants. So I, I haven't been, I've been around a lot of football, just like you have, Lawrence. Not too many times have you had that less targets to a wide receivers in a game and still come out winning. That was pretty good. Unbelievable. It was, a, you know, to throw basically net almost. He netted under 100 yards passing if you had in some of the sacks. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think McKinney has really played well. I know we all liked him last year, but he's just a player that, you know, we, you miss Pepper's leadership. You miss his energy. But let's be real here. Xavier McKinney is the superior football player. And I think that is showing because Peppers is no longer out there. And I hate to say that about a guy we all love and care about on this football team. But McKinney has really just buttoned up that back end. He can cover better. He moves better. Um, and it's a throwing league. And then, not to be forgotten, James Bradbury is playing way better than he was in the first month of the season. He was horrible. Let's be real. He was giving up. He was getting targeted. But the secondary is playing better. I always thought the D-line – you know, we miss Blake Martinez, but but Blake or Crowder has played really well in the middle. He's a good cover guy. And some of these young guys, you know, Aziz and uh, Roche are, listen, 
they they, they have expectations coming out of the bye. Like they, they're going to be healthy. And, and listen, they should play well. Everyone's expecting them to play well. I think, you know, the schedule eases up a little bit. Of course, you get Tom Brady on Monday Night Football right out of the gate. But, um, you know, Patrick Graham's defense caused problems last year for Tom Brady. It, you know, it wasn't – it was a close yeah. game. You know, I think one thing fans struggle with, guys, I want to get your guys' take on this as two guys that played in the league a long time, it is almost the concept of the path to victory, Right. I think every fan wants to play a certain way every week, no matter what. But I think when you're in the building, you listen to coaches, they look at a game, they see the opponent, they see the matchup, they see what's going on inside their own locker room, to your point, Lawrence, with all the injuries that the Giants have had. And they say, all right, if we want to win this game, this game has to go this way. And I feel like the Giants understood these last two games against Kansas City and Las Vegas. If you're going to win those two games, you're going to have to ugly the games up a little bit. And it might not be pretty. You might not throw the ball a ton, but – that's the best chance of getting to victory. And look, they almost beat Kansas City. They're a couple plays here or there away. You know, they didn't have any of those Xavier McKinney plays. They didn't have a pick six in that game against the Chiefs. They got them against the Raiders. So can you guys just talk a little bit about how coaches need and have to form these game plans based on matchups to figure out a way to win, even if it might not be the optimal way fans want to play based on what analytics tell you week in, week out? I, I think, I think it's easy. Um, you know, first, first and foremost, you got to get the players to believe what the coaches are putting in front of them. And if you have that, they are way ahead of the game. Okay. So then what you do is you're studying the opponent all week, in this case, the last two weeks. Um, and then it really comes down to John. It comes down to what we've been talking about forever is discipline and execution with this team. If this team executes and has the proper discipline on certain things, they're sitting at uh, way more wins than they have right now. Um, you look at the Kansas City game, absolutely, they could have won that game. The Washington, the Atlanta game, those are just some of the things that we talk about as far as discipline. But the last two weeks, the discipline was not there two weeks ago. They almost won the game. Yeah. This week, the discipline was there. They beat a good opponent. Let's not, let's not you know, throw uh, Oakland, or excuse me, not Oakland. It's uh, Las, Las Vegas, Vegas down yeah. the road. Yeah. Because they were they were they were a good team. They still are. They were they were first in the AFC West. Yeah. Absolutely. So I figure like when you execute and you play disciplined football and Tynesy, I'm sure you hear this in your head time and time again. Penalties cost you games. Penalties oh. cost you games. Hey boys, penalties cost you games. That's all <laughs> I'm profit ever used to say. And Turnovers and penalties. Way, it's penalties. Penalties. It's true. And so this team going ahead if they can buy into that game plan that the coaches are giving them every single week and execute and be disciplined then this is that this can be a pretty decent football team that's my take yeah. on John. yeah uh, it's funny you bring up the penalties i'm watching that game last night uh chicago and pittsburgh and there was you know chicago had i don't know 12 13 penalties something like that and i know i've taught my son really well he just started football he's 14 years old um he was disgusted oh, no. he, he was disgusted by the penalties last night like he said you, you can never win, Dad. You can't win that game. Look at all these penalties. So I'm like, I, said, I said, you know what? We have passed on this Tom Coughlin penalties turnovers. You know, the, the Giants do a really good job of creating almost like a brand new version of themselves every week, it seems like. You know, and, and it's really because they've had to offensively. But I think it's a skill set that will do them well once they finally learn to start winning consistently. Because – you know, like much like the Patriots, you just never knew what you were going to get from a Belichick team in terms of are they going to, you know, run up, line up in 11 personnel, run the ball the whole game? Are they going to spread you out? So I think being multiple, Patrick Graham's defense is multiple. The offense has obviously been able to adapt with all the injuries. Um, you know, I think that's what scares some teams when they play the Giants because they have no idea what the hell's showing up on Monday night in, in Tampa Bay uh, in two weeks from now. So, um, they get some bodies back. I, I like, listen, I like this team. I mean, there's a lot of young guys making a lot of plays for this team. They just need to figure out how to win. I think they need a little taste and they're getting that here. A uh, big game of Monday night didn't go their way in Kansas city, but they've won two out of three games. I mean, that, that is, that's, that's pretty good in the NFL two and a three. Now, if you said the giants were going to go two and three and lose in Kansas city, uh, we probably would have taken that. We just didn't get off to a very good start before that. Right. They're a young team. They're a young team, yeah. and, and young yeah. teams have to learn how to win, and they will certainly sooner or later. You know, Lawrence, you mentioned the injuries, right? And I think after the bye week, 
expectations are, and Joe Judge said this on his Monday conference call, they think Saquon will be back. They think Andrew Thomas is going to be back. You hope Sterling Shepard is able to make his return after hurting his quad a couple weeks ago. How much do you think the approach of this Giants offense might change with all those pieces back on the field, specifically Andrew Thomas. So I really think his addition just opens up so many more things you can do if you can trust that protection at left tackle. Yeah, Andrew Thomas, you know, we had him on our show. What a great kid, great young man. You know, um, he's play, he was playing at a very, very high level. And, and kudos to him for working his butt off after surgery. I, you know, I think Pert has done a serviceable job at left. I mean, it's not his natural position, but I think Pert has actually played pretty well in the absence of Thomas. You can maybe move him over to right. Solder had a good game last week, but has not played well overall at right tackle. So if you get these two young tackles going and playing well, Pert for me just needs more reps. You know, you watch him, and he was he was getting he didn't have a great camp. He got beat out by Solder, but man, as he's played more this year, he's played really well. And the inside guys, you know, Billy Price, Hernandez, the kind of you know they're they're is it Scura Scuda Scura? Scura yeah you got it Scura I always get his name wrong. Um, they have done an admirable job. So the, the, this narrative that the offensive line sucks, I, I just don't buy it. I, th- I thought they've played pretty well all year. You know, they've had a bunch of moving parts. You miss some of the guys. But Saquon Barkley's best medicine is Booker. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, b- back on the Booker and the Saquon thing, each team needs two really good running backs. Yep. In this case, you've got two different skill sets. So I think they yeah. can complement each other. And I think that going forward, that'll be great. As far as your question, John, about the offense, I, I feel like, I think it's, you know, it's, it's funny how you try to get used to what you have every week. Well, what happens when you get all of them back? How are you going to certainly yeah. get that quickly? But however, game planning for the defense will be much more difficult when you have everybody back, because if they're going to pay attention to one or two of these guys, you're going to have a lot of more, a lot more playmakers available to you because you remember when we, when the season started or not even when the season started, when they first came into training camp and on paper, we were looking at this offense, we kind of understood what the giants defense was going to be like, even though they weren't at the beginning of the season. So we didn't really care about that, but we looked at the offense from a standpoint is how many playmakers were on this team. And you got kind of excited about that. So I think here we are, a couple of weeks away, 10 days, if you will, or whatever it is before the next game. Hey man, this is going to be exciting, but other teams are going to have to game plan if they're all there. And that's going to be, that's going to be hard to do. You know, Tanzi, how do you think they handle that? If you have Tony Galladay, <laughs> Shepard and Slayton all healthy at the same time, they haven't had literally, I don't think they've had a game where all four guys have been on the field yet this year. How do you think they dole out the touches? Ooh. You want to make sure you get the ball in Tony's hand, Galladay's hand. Shepard's probably your most consistent wide receiver in the short and intermediate range. How do you think they work that when all four of those guys are hopefully back on the field in a couple weeks? You know, I think you somehow have to award Slayton for his availability. I, I know that sounds crazy. He may be not as good a player as, as Tony or, but I, I think he should dress. I, I'm, I'm not disappointed in the fact that Slayton, but Slayton has just not been targeted for whatever reason. Um, he's healthy. I think he's a good player. He's had two really good years, his first two years in the league. Um, how do you handle it? I think it's a really good problem to have, right? Um, but obviously it's going to come down to, you know, special teams. Does which one of those guys, and I don't think any of them plays, you know, special teams, maybe a little bit on punt return for KT and maybe Slayton, but, you know, Shepard's been banged up a lot too. And Galladay is coming off the, if it's a bone bruise, you know, this week, those things can take a long time um, to, to heal. So, um We'll see, man. I think, you know, this is, I almost go back and I, when, on my show, when we talk about this team, I say, look, this team has, the team that we all want to see is, was the team that played in New Orleans, right? That was the offensively who we think this team could be. Um, but man, that's, that's a, that's a lot of really good players coming back and, and we'll see what they, what Jason Garrett chooses to do uh, at Monday night in Tampa. Now I want to swap over to the defense and then, and then we can kind of talk some special teams and then reminisce a little bit about your guys' days together with the Giants. What do you guys think has been the key to the Giants' defensive turnaround here? I know there's a narrative out there that they've made things simpler. I'm not sure I quite buy that watching them. Uh, they're not allowing as many big plays. I know that for sure. So what do you guys think has changed over the last few weeks that's allowed the Giants' defense to kind of get back to what they were doing when they were playing at their peak in 2020? Um, well, I'll go tight. Listen, I, I think that the loss of Blake Martinez was a shock. And I feel like yep. that really played a huge part on the complexity of the defense 
And I feel like he's like another defensive coordinator on the field. And not only does he do that, he also makes plays every freaking down. I mean, yeah. guys around every he's play. unreal. And so I feel like uh, when that was taken away, I feel like, you know, Patrick Graham had to find somebody to take that place. And I just didn't think it was that easy. So evolution, it kind of went through these games. And next thing you know, he said, hey, we're going to have to do some things that simplify the defense a little bit because the fact that I don't have a guy out there like Blake Martinez to get guys set up to be able to uh, communicate the right way. And I feel like that's what happened. And finally, they're 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 catching their group. I think some leadership has, pro has started to, to take its place as far as like in the back end. I mean, you got Bradbury. You know, Logan is uh, Ryan is a heck of a leader. I think this, yeah. the defensive line guys, they just all stepped up and said, hey, guys, we're going to have to collectively – do better than we are. And I think the biggest thing, and we've talked about this from day one, is that when you have that many players on your team making that type of money, big time players, those guys got to produce. They were not producing. And now in the last three weeks, those guys are making plays. And my guy, uh, Quincy Roche from Miami in the last few weeks has been outstanding. I mean, what a great pickup they got. They have a six round guy comes in here and you know, basically benches Zemenez because of it. So I think they're kind of getting some younger guys to play too. Yeah, I agree with everything Feek says. You know, uh, the secondary, nobody was really playing well after Blake got hurt. It, it just seemed like they were in shock. They were looking for someone to lead. Obviously, Logan Ryan does a really good job. Pep, when he went out, listen, he's a great leader too. So the defensive line, I think, is playing better. You know, they're getting a bit more pressure than they were in the first half, first three or four games. So, they, listen, when you get pressure, you don't have to cover as long. Everyone looks better. Um, they are giving up yards, but that's the intent of the defense. They just really want to butt, buckle up in the red zone and make you kick field goals. So, um, I love it. I think the defense is going to be someone we're going to have to lean on. The offense is going to have to catch up to them in the second half of the season. And uh, they should be proud of what they've, they've put together in the last couple of weeks. But – Listen, there's no doubt it needs to be better. They need to create some more turnovers and get some more sacks. So I think that if they do that, then you could have a you know a winning record in the second half. We've heard, we've heard Feig's opinion on him a lot over the course of the year, LT on our shows. Your thoughts on what you've seen from Daniel Jones so far? Uh, I don't think they've been able to unleash him the way they would have liked, given everything going on around him. But from what you've seen, what have you liked? And what do you think about him for the last nine games of the year here? I love Daniel Jones. Um you know, he could be my teammate, quarterback, any day of the year. I, th I think if there's one player, no one has ever been dealt a more unfair, almost, circumstances in his career based on the offensive line and then the skill guys. And then um, I've just never seen anyone uh, have such horrible, horrible luck in terms of the guys around him, but then handle it with so much grace and, and toughness. Like, yeah, Daniel Jones is, is – I'm a huge fan of his. And when – you know, I – I, I keep going back to this. Daniel Jones is the guy you saw in New Orleans. That's the guy who – that's who Daniel Jones is with the skill guys around him, Andrew Thomas locking down Cam Jordan, one of the premier pass rushers in the league at left tackle. That's who Daniel Jones is in a dome on the road against a very good football team. So uh, I love him. I, I just – you know, I just wish, you know, hopefully guys can stay healthy for him. You know, he – that spin move he made last week, I mean, the guy is a winner. I know that's he wants to win. He plays hard. He plays tough. So I'm all in on Daniel Jones. He's our franchise quarterback. If we can just keep people healthy around him. All right. I'm going to hand this off to you guys now. And let's start with this first kicking in the modern NFL. Lawrence. It's funny. I went back and I looked at your giants career. I think you kicked maybe you made four or five 50 yard field goals in, in, in your years with the giants, just because you weren't asked to kick them. Right. It wasn't right. Common. Tom was. Yeah. Yeah, Tom was very close to the vest because yeah. we had guys like this guy on our screen, Jeff Fiegels, that would put you inside the 10 yard line. So, hey, we don't need to take a chance on missing this. What do you think about how the kicking games evolved in terms of, terms of how kickers are now booting 65 yard kicks with like no problems? It's crazy. Jeff and I talk about it all the time, but obviously you're the guy that, you know, was the field goal kicker. Just your thoughts <clears> on how <throat> the kicking game has evolved over the years. It, and then you guys, please go back and forth on it. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's, um, you know, I was on the field Monday night in Arrowhead uh, with my boys, chopping it up with Coach Quinn and T-Mac and Gettleman and Abrams. And, man, I tell you what, that freaking Harrison Butker kid, he looked like he could play NFL, he could play tight end in the NFL probably 10 years ago. He is 6'4", 225. I mean, and he, and he looks good. Like, just looks like a complete athlete. 
This so isn't like answer. Sebastian Janikowski, 225 no. pounds. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a different, different, different look. But, man, and, and I think as you go through, the balls are obviously better. I think the balls are good. But, man, it, it is impressive. The, the amount of long-distance kicks we see. I mean, just last night, Boswell and Pittsburgh, 52-54 in that place. And then, of course, the Santos kick was such a waste. What a joke. He can't hit the 65-yarder, and they ruined his streak of 40 consecutive made field goals in the NFL. I'm getting off topic, but I wanted to rant <laughs> on behalf of Cairo Santos because they're like, you've made 40 in a row, but go kick a 65-yarder. It just ruined his – I hate that 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 happened to him, but he wasn't even close. But they're really good. Well, I think, and you all agree with me here, times that you know the way both kicking and punting has evolved – is that when I'm a little bit older than Lawrence, but you know, the fact of the matter is, is that we didn't have all these camps to go to. We didn't have all these training things. These guys are training now at, you know, 11, 12 years old. And I, I know that sounds really young, but the fact is that, you know, they, they fast forward that for 10 years, they're getting training yeah. and they're going to camps. These guys are so defined and just, they're so precise nowadays. And not to mention, you know, the workouts and everything like that. I mean, Lawrence and I played a long time because we kept in great shape and we did workouts, but it was just to the point where that's kind of, these guys are, they're stronger, they're bigger. As Lawrence was saying, I'm looking at the punting statistics, just going back five years ago. And Lawrence, you probably remember this in our one, the last game of the year in 2008, I was going into that game and we played the Vikings going in with a 40 yard net average. I was coming out of the season with a 40 yard net average. I told Quinn, I'm kicking everything away from the returner. I'm going to bomb the thing because I yeah. want my 40 yard net average. And he was like, okay, whatever you want to do, just don't give up any returns. I said, we won't. But the fact is that was, there was only like two guys that had 40 yard net average in that season. Well, you look at the NFL just last year, half the league is over 40 yards net, half of them. So it's almost like you can get cut now for having less than a 40 yard net. Well, just if you want to have fun, anybody listening to this, just go. I know you don't want to look up kicking statistics or just go look at the punting statistics and look at the lowest gross average and the lowest net average and go back 10 years and compare the two. You'll be like, what it's is going mad, on? It's a huge difference. Are they testing for steroids or what, what's going on here? Man, and, Andy know. Lee is Andy Lee, who we all played with and against is still playing and averaging like 51 yards. Um, but, you know, I saw Riley Dixon. He is a big man. Yeah, he's a big man. Um, I mean, these punters are huge. Uh, so, you know, the, the kid in Kansas City, Townsend or whatever, I mean, he's a big dude. They, these what kids about Johnny are huge. Hector? Jesus. Oh, man, massive. <laughs> I, you know, at, our, at the Super Bowl anniversary, I was on the field. And, uh, you know, the halftime deal, and he actually came over and said, hey, you know, I never met Johnny Hecker, but what a nice kid. Uh, man, he looked like a freaking yeah, quarterback. Look yeah, I look up at him. Yeah, they're big, and I think a lot of it's you know it's the size of some of these kids too. I mean, they're big, they're strong, and they realize that you know me and Fiegel's made kicking and punting cool, so that's why they do it. <laughs> and by the way, John, Oba, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, and and you know, a lot of people don't really understand this, but there isn't one special teams coach I think ever in the league that's ever played the position ever. No, and so they they themselves are learning. Um, as the years have gone by, they're learning the, the, the position way better than they ever did. I mean, uh, Coach Quinn was probably the, the best at this, you know, for all the coaches that I had. Um, he didn't say much, but when he did say something, he, you knew it was going to be something really good as far as like technique wise and things like that. Yeah. But I think a lot of these coaches understand the position a little bit more and they're able to coach it. Where in the past, uh, one of my special teams coaches, Pete Rodriguez, always used to tell me that, listen, you're not going to get any coaching from me kickers and punters have to be self-taught and that's kind of the difference between now and, and back in the years past yeah listen and mike leach is having open tryouts in mississippi state so starkville i was actually considering driving down um you know it's the same thing in college though Feeks. these college coaches they 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 want to publicly shame their kicker which mike leach did this i'm getting off topic but who's your, who coaches these kids this is on you you're the head coach Nobody mm -hmm. coaches them. And then I went on Mississippi State's website. They have five freaking strength coaches, but nobody for the teams. There you go, Mike. Yeah, Candy Cornette. Um, I just – he just is a, a mess. But anyway, to Lefeeks' point, um, I think you asked about Graham Gano, John. Yeah. Answer both. Um, go ahead, please. So it, it, is, it is difficult. But T-Mac and, and, and Coach Quinn, 
who are both still there, just in reverse roles, are still some of the best to do it. And it's there's a reason why they continuously have really good kickers and punters. Yeah. The you know, because if you think about this list, Graham Gano, who's here, obviously they made the choice to, to get him, but they've had Boswell in camp. They had Rosas, who went to a Pro Bowl. They had McManus. T Mac had Butker. Like, think about that Rolodex of kickers right there in their prime. I know Rosas is kind of having some stuff going on now, but like he was an elite kicker. They know what they're doing. T Mac and Quinn, that's really why we had success there. I had my best years there because they just let you do your job and didn't really mess with you until they maybe thought they saw something. And it's funny because I, I had dinner with Graham when they played in Kansas City. And, you know, Graham was not necessarily hitting the ball really well. I know he had maybe a missed PAT and maybe a field goal. And um, he told me about how Quinn approached him uh, on fixing something. And and I, I I knew exactly what he was talking about because, you know, Quinn would do that to me too. He did, he never needled, but when he thought he knew what you, something was going wrong, he would yeah. just talk to you. And all of a sudden, boom, it clicked. And that's what Graham said. I said, I said Graham, and I told Graham this because he hasn't played for Quinny very long. I said, he's not going to speak to you unless he knows exactly what's wrong. He's not just going to fluff you. So, you He's know, like Graham said, he He's is like a scientist. scientist. Yeah. I mean, literally, like, that, remember, yeah. remember we used to call it, we're going to go to the lab? The lab. Yeah, and so what he did lab. is, and Graham said he fixed him. You know, it was really, we're talking about a two-inch plant foot that was too close. And Graham wow. never saw that. So, and Graham's back to stroking it. And the question on him is, that kid's elite. And, man, what a, he's had a, he had a good career. But, man, he, it's really been, it really took off when he got to the Meadowlands. Holy cow. I mean, he is just point and shoot at this point. He's on autopilot. I mean, the amount of 50 plus yarders he's making, and he's made, you know, maybe not so big at the end of the game, but he's made a lot of kicks just to keep this team in games or, you know, maybe extend that lead to two scores. Um, good dude, man. I like him. Yeah, he's been a good player. Very good yeah. player. Before we hit 2007, when you guys were there together, Lawrence, you mentioned the 2011 celebration, the 10th anniversary a couple weeks ago. You were down there on the field. You were part of the festivities all weekend. We had the little thing on Saturday night in the city. Just what was that whole weekend like, you know, catching up all your old teammates and everybody over those uh, few days over that weekend? It was a lot of fun. You know, everybody still looks the same. You know, we missed some guys that weren't there. But, um, you know, anytime you get to catch up with guys who you climb the mountaintop with, it's a lot of fun, man just a lot of stories and drinking and hanging out and seeing everybody's kids. Um, so, you know, I'll, you know, Joanne did a great job with that. She always does. The Giants do a great job with those things, especially in this COVID world. It was a little bit different than the 42 one, but um, a lot of credit to the Giants for putting that on. And, and, and it's a lot of fun. As you know, you got to see some of the guys. Um, it's, it's funny because it's like you never left. And yeah. it was, it's been 10 years, like yeah. 10 freaking years, but, I was still messing with like Derek Martin or, you know, Corey Webster or whoever it may have been. It was just like, you know, we never left. So it's a special group. You know, you never, it's a very special bond and, and it's forever. And that's what I love about it. What is your favorite moment from that year, that Super Bowl in 2011? Oh, favorite moment. It could be one Man. with the one that has to do with you directly, somebody else, whatever sticks out in your mind. Um, well, naturally, I mean, sure, kicking the field goal in San Francisco to put us in the Super Bowl comes to mind. Man, I'll tell you what, th this may sound weird. I think that win in New England week 10 was one of the coolest, you know, regular season games I've ever played in just because I think the Patriots had won 20 in a row. Like when I think back on that year, that's one game that really sticks out. We went in there, beat them. They had won 20 in a row. Of course, we're 10 point dogs. And, you know, Jake Ballard had a great game and Eli was playing well. So, Probably that game, you know, some of the playoff games were good, but um, more specifically that regular season game. I don't know why when you said that, that's just what came to mind. All right. So now let's jump back to Super Bowl 42 season and I will get out of the way and I'll just start the conversation by saying, guys, uh, tell me what the NFC championship game in Green Bay was like. Figs, <laughs> Figs, I tell this story all the time because I was in, you know, I, I came up for this anniversary and played in the Giants charity golf outing. Were you out there, Figs? I know I couldn't make it that okay. Yeah. Okay. So was I was, I was asking again. around. It was fun. I know I asked around and, and it was funny because that's naturally the biggest question. You first question you get from guys when you get paired with a group. So I played with a bunch of great guys and they, they specifically go to that game. And so I always tell this story about feeds where, you know, we usually did like 10 kick on each side 
uh, you know, 10 field goals to warm up. And I think we maybe got to do three or four or five, not, not many Feeks. And Feeks looked at me, he goes, okay, oh, I cannot catch the football. I'm done. I'm like, yeah, I'm done too. Like he naturally, like it was so cold. He could not catch the snaps from our howitzer rocket throwing snapper, Jay Alford, um, left-handed. Um, so we just stopped kicking because I had to worry about Feeks. Feeks had to go punt. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to make sure he got his work in punting, but well, yeah, we tried. kicked like four balls. You tried. I tell this story all the time. I tell people of all the yeah. years that I played. And remember, 2007 was my 20th season. Yeah. And so for 20 years, I had always warmed up. There wasn't a game that I never warmed up for, except there was one game, <laughs> that one, because I was on the, we warmed up on one side. We went to the other. I told Lawrence, I said, listen, I can't feel my hands, man. I, I'm done. I, you know, so I went in, I never warmed up. I never punted that game. I never warmed up. I went right in and I remember putting my hands underneath the, the faucet in the, in the bathroom, in the locker room, my hands were so cold in the, in the warm water, they started to hurt. And I was thinking to myself, Oh my God, what am I doing? Are my hands ever going to like, are they ever going to come back? You know? So that was just so freaking cold. And, and during the game, uh, <laughs> we were like two Eskimos on the warm. Man, it was brutal. <laughs> I tell people all the time, I've never been, I mean, obviously the temperature, I've never, but it, the mental toughness it took to get through that game, obviously we had the highs and the lows. We made a couple of kicks, we missed a couple of kicks, and then we make the big one at the end. But just the survival, man, I don't know that anyone knows what that feels like. Like, I always go back to that. Like, like I couldn't do that now. I'm 43 years old right now. I couldn't do that. There's no way I could go back into that, those elements and replay that game again and handle it. I would just die, I think. I'm just not mentally tough anymore. <laughs> Like, remember, remember, I was 43 in that game. So you yeah. <laughs> That's a great slide. <laughs> so, no, listen, your blood doesn't flow that well when you're 43. No. It's just kind of, you know, get a little bit cold. But I'll tell you this. Um, oh. I just remember uh, the whole sequence. And I know that we've you've heard it. And, and Lawrence, you've gone over it, the whole sequence about the, the last kick of the game and, you know, and how it, it was it everything was kind of up to that point. And, and I'll never, ever forget the fact that I'm sitting there on the sideline and I'm just, I know I'm going in. There's no way that we're kicking this field goal. And I am so ready to just go in and do my little, you know, tip sh chip shot down there, get inside the 10, put the defense on the field. And, and lo and behold, I'll never forget number nine running out on the field. It's just, and we're lo all looking at each other and Coughlin's Playing looking the, uh, around and he, he just could not say, he couldn't say, well, first of all, he probably couldn't talk because his face was so red. I thought he was going to have permanent, like, like, uh, you know, uh, frostbite frost forever. Um, but man, I'll tell you, that was, and I was just like, okay, here we go. And I remember running out there, not saying a word to Lawrence because I knew he was so focused and we never really say anything to the kickers. Anyways, we, we've done this so many times. We just know, get the spot, you know, three back two or whatever it is. And, uh, I just never forget. Now, this is the truth. So a little high snap, ball goes down. And I know the natural flight of Lawrence's kick is a little, as we call in, in excuse me, in golf is a little draw, right? That ball starts out to the right. And I'm getting goosebumps right now, man. And I knew it was coming back. I knew that thing was coming right back in there. And man, it was over. The worst part about that field goal, Lawrence Tynes, is you running off the field and leaving me hanging to dry. No high five, nothing. You were so cold, you just left me. I was left gone. Me. And well, you got Eli came out pretty quickly, and Michael Strahan, I think, were there yeah. pretty pretty soon after. You know what, Feeks? If you remember, you know, I get asked this question a lot. Like, like I was three. I was three for five that day. It was the best game of my life. Like that that forty three yarder that we missed like maybe with. Yard with eight minutes left like that's really what had I not had that attempt I don't think I would have felt as good about going out there for a 47 yarder because I hit that pretty well I just didn't start it I didn't play the win right so I missed it yeah. left the one at the end of regulation I'm way past it now that was just the worst operation of all time I'm trying to buy time I'm leaning back Feeks did a hell of a job getting it down and so listen that kick is what it is it was terrible but I knew if we could get the snap down in the hold on the on the 47 like i was thinking man i hit that 43 yarder pretty damn good yeah. i can get this ball there and we just we started it on the right you know line if you will and then it, it just drew right in but um it's unbelievable to think back on that game because they show it every year so we never get to forget it almost you know things like it's will forever 
well, be on I'll the uh, what, I, highlight I, reel. I, I love it because everybody does talk about it. And um, I will never, ever, ever forget that because that's just, you know, that was the one that got us to the Super Bowl. And, you know, I, I, my, my career would not have been complete without, well, first of all, that was the first NFC championship game, let alone the first Super Bowl I ever went to and won. Wow. You know, being in a league as long as I did and not being able to have that uh, would have been horrible. But I mean, that's to awesome. me, I, 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 there's not, I had no, nothing else in, in, that, I had, that I had to do in the league uh, longevity, Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, everything doesn't matter, you know. So I was just so happy. But that, I, it's kind of funny that that was that was a heck of a football game for everyone. Oh and man, cold. It gets that, brought up so much. So mentally much, tough. So. That was the thing. I think our team was so mentally tough to we be were. able to go in there and do that. Yeah. Well, as you remember, Brandon set the tone when he came out and hit Woodson right in the chops, oh, like yeah. five yeah. plays in, yeah. and I'm sure those DBs were like, "Oh boy, I don't want to hit this guy." You know, but ultimately we ended up, I think, throwing, you know, obviously Eli and Toomer and Plax had unbelievable games. It was just our year, man. We were, yeah. you know, it's it's hard to watch kind of this, you know, not to, to poo-poo on this current Giants team, but, you know, having played for a couple teams like that and during that Coughlin era, and then you get to kind of watch this last, you know, 10 years of Giants football, it just frustrates you as a fan because we care so much about the organization and know sure. – um, but they're getting there. I, listen, I'm a huge fan of Joe Judges, too. So I, I like them. I like this team. I just need to get healthy. You know, John, one thing that's uh, that's unique about the kickers and, you know, years ago, there wasn't a snapper, but now there is. I mean, the snapper is part of the, you know, the specialist. Um, but we're just such we just everybody becomes just such great friends because, you know, we spend so much time together on the field, um, you know, and, and we're we're such good workers. I mean, we know what we got to get done and we all are just, we, we kind of thrive off of each other. And I think that's, what's so special about the bond that you have with all the kickers and punters. And obviously, you know, when you play as long as both of us did in the league, there's other guys that come in, there's snappers, there's holders, there's kickers, there's everybody, but no matter what, even the guys there for two weeks or 10 years, it doesn't matter. There's that great bond of specialists that, that we can share and you can always have that bond. And I think that everybody else in the league understands that, um, but as a fan, someone like yourself, it's hard to understand, but we just, we just do so. I mean, how about our training camps, Tynesy? I mean, how much fun do oh, we have? Amazing. I mean, we, when we were, John, you were up in Albany and we used to have the uh, apartments up there. I mean, we just hung out and everybody was envious as, of us because we were out of meetings before anybody and we were out to drink beers in the, in the, uh, in the apartments and they didn't, and we just good. had a good time. Listen, it's, it's like, like Jeff said, everybody in the NFL wants to be a kicker and punter except on Sunday. And, yeah. and I, I love that quote because guys will tell you that all the time. They just want our work week schedule, but they don't want to be out there. They don't want to be out there on Sunday with the game on the line or having to hit a big punt backed up out of the end zone. I mean, it's just one of those things. And I think the respect is so big is because when you think about 32 people in the world get to do it, kicker, punter per year, that's it in the world. 32 people in the entire universe get to play in the NFL. The respect that you have for the guys that are able to do that is through the roof and you know you know you go out there and you may get one shot you may get no shots you may get two shots a game and i think it's the ultimate you know people always ask you things i'm sure you know about it's weird like you know do players mess with you but like like i'm like mess with me i'm like i feel like we're one of the most respected guys on the football team sure. if you do your job well um you just got to take care of your business like pig said out of sight out of mind you know don't be out there screwing around when the guys are doing their stuff, go work with them, sweat with them, run with them, lift with them. And I think guys, you know, you see it now. That's why kickers make $5 million a year now. I mean, it's, yeah, the NFL respects them. They deserve it. They deserve every penny they get. So. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Oof. So what was it like, guys, getting the operation right? You know, I imagine that takes a lot of precision and a lot of work. Mm. So how do you get that to the point where, Lawrence, the way Jeff works with the long snapper allows you to be as consistent as you were. So it's really between those two guys in a sense, you know, to get down, you know, because if you think about where you have to catch the football, that's really the most important piece. Like, do you, do you go get it a little bit? Do you let it get into you? Do you let it travel? So basically, where are you catching the football from that snapper in order for the laces to be at it like a premium position to where you just put it down? You know, Mason Crosby had a crappy deal this past weekend in Kansas City. I think we all saw the laces left. So it's really between those two. Jeff, to his credit, has obviously seen a million snaps 
probably why his knee hurts from getting on a knee exactly. That's why. 18 billion times. But, you know, him seeing all these snaps, we had a really unique situation that people won't remember this. But in 07, when I got there, uh, Ryan Keel is the snapper. And he pops an Achilles and, you know, one week, two weeks into camp, we got this third round pick named Jay Alford. Coach Coughlin basically says at the end of practice, he goes, anyone else snap? And Alford <laughs> raises his hand. I'm going, oh, shnikes. And then uh, Zach Diossi, who ultimately ends up being the snapper forever, does the punt. So people, what people don't realize is that season, the Super Bowl 42, we had a punt snapper and a field goal snapper, two separate guys. Yeah. I don't know when that has last ever happened. And, oh, by the way, he's left-handed, Yeah, Jay yeah. Alford. And that's hard. So Fees could probably tell you more about because he oh. he zipped the ball. I mean, it was, oh and we God. never got any work. We never, Fees, remember, we never yeah. got to practice. Practice. Nope. We never got to practice very much. So it was used to being, you know, having your, your holder or your snapper with you. Yeah. Jay was a D line. Like we never school. had him. So that back in my rookie days and first years in the league, there wasn't a snapper like Jay or uh, um, like, uh, you know, a guy that was with you all the time. Like Diossi and these guys were with their specialists. Well, before these guys would come after practice, they would, they, they don't want to snap. They, they just got <laughs> no. up the whole day. They just got done practicing football. So, hey, Jay, can we get some snaps? So I'll never forget the first time that he came, Lawrence. And remember, Jay Alford is at the time, he's not as big anymore, but this guy was big, strong. I mean, he's oh. left. So I'm not told he's left-handed, okay? So he gets over the ball and not in the, the first snap, I didn't even realize which way that snap, the, the rotation was going because it came back at 150 miles an hour. And I said to the guy, I'm like, Jay, dude, you, you can't do that. I'm eight yards away from you. You can't, this isn't a long snap. This is a short snap. Slow it down. Next snap comes. I drop it. He goes, is that better? I go, yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, that's better. Let's try it again. Took me three snaps to finally figure out it's going the wrong way. It's the spin is coming the wrong way. I'm like, dude, left -handed, are you yeah. he's like, yeah. I'm like, I look at Quinny. I'm like, you didn't tell me the guy was left-handed. He's like, <laughs> it's a big deal. I don't think he knew it either, honestly. And I'm like, okay, no. so we got to get used to that. So talk about the operation, uh, John. That takes a lot of time to learn how to catch it left hand. And then I got to go and go with Diossi, who's right-handed on the on the punt. So it's, it's, it took a little bit of time. But, hey, listen, uh, it worked. It worked fine. Jay offered, to his credit, you got to give him a lot of credit, man. Because man, yeah, yeah, that kid had a sack in the Super Bowl and snapped field goals and PATs in the Super Bowl. That's yeah. probably never been done. You know, yeah. so I think that's always a cool story I like to tell about Jay Alford because no one really probably knows who Jay Alford is, to be honest. To answer your question, the operation, it starts with that snapper. I mean, if that guy yeah. can throw the, the rotations by the time I catch it and the laces are there, it makes my job so much easier and it makes Lawrence's job tremendously oh, easier. But, yes. you know, when the timing is, is off, things can happen. I'll never forget, uh, you know, <laughs> when John Carney was here, we were playing in Washington and the snap was really low. And I went to grab it and I bobbled it when I, when I did, it was an extra point, the old extra point. So I just put my, I put my, the ball down with both hands on the ball like this, literally. And I didn't know whether to take this hand off where he's going <laughs> to or take this hand. Cause I would just wanted to get it. So I just kept both of them on and, and John kicked the ball. He kicked my hand. The ball went through the goalpost, but I'll never forget how bad that hurt. So bad, but all because of just, the I've done that. Of, Oh, yeah. I've done that before. I kicked Dustin Colquitt's hand here in Kansas City. So, yeah, tough I stuff. mean, it's not good. Hey, somebody's got to be do it, right? I mean, it's, it's listen, not an easy it. job, man. When I see game winning field goals now or any kind of big pressure kicks, like my nerves or palpitations go right to the holder. It's, it's weird. Like, it's not the kicker anymore. I'm like, you know, people forget how hard of a job that is. Like, yeah, no it's the most underappreciated job in the NFL because. And I get it. It's our fault. We make it look so easy. You guys make it look so dang easy that you put any Joe Blow athlete down there to do that. They can't do it. Well, I tell everybody all the time, guess how, how fast the snap and the hold and the kick go. People just they don't yeah. know when you say 1.2 seconds. Two five, yeah, 1.25 max. I, I think about that, this. That's the whole deal. Boom, that's it. I mean, think about it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot that can go wrong in 1.2 seconds. So it's got to be perfect. You know, so yeah. 
It's worse. Right, I got two questions before we say goodbye. Lawrence, why the hell are the laces and what direction they're facing so important for a kicker? Science. Uh, Absolute yeah. just science, basic science. Um, you know, if they're if they're straight back, that's more of a miss. You can still hit, you know, big kicks, but for but you rarely ever practice that way. So really, you know, laces back sucks, but you can still make the kick. Laces left and right is a problem. You know, Mason Crosby, like I talked about, I had one this weekend against the Chiefs. His holder just put the ball down, laces clear as day left. He missed left, right? The ball's going to go left. So, so it's it, really it, important. It, it, by the way, I just want to get into the signs. Is that just because it's it catches weight. the wind? Is it ca- basically, it's like drag? He or? towed it. He hit a little bit of an next ball. I think it's a little bit of everything, right? You you just, he was a little bit surprised by what his holder was doing. But then there there is, you know, it was, it was not a short kick. It's just a weight issue, right? The mm. laces are on the left side of the ball. As the ball travels, it's going to start to, you know, drag that way. Got it. The coefficient, or so, I don't know. What the hell I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, geez, I, I went to Troy, not the U, you know? That's right. Yep. You would have known that if you went to the U. But yeah, yeah, I'm I sure. definitely would have. Yeah. Uh, Jeff was in science class all the time in his time in Miami, I'm sure. No question Absolutely. about it. 100%. All right. <laughs> and finally, Tynes, you do have a really good um, either Fiegel story for me or a good, yeah. Give me a good Fiegel story that maybe I haven't heard before so I can make fun of him. Oh, man. Do I have any good Fiegel stories? Jeez. There's not many. I mean, not, not off the top of my head. The one thing I will tell Jeff in a public setting is that I was a better football player because of him. And Thank he you. really taught me the ropes. I showed up four years, thought I knew it, but I didn't until I got to hang around and play with him. Uh, you know, I love the way he – he fathered his kids, husband, football player. So Jeff Fiegels, to me, is one of my biggest idols in the game, and, and I love him for it. So And he showed me the earplugs. That's right. So, yeah. you know, Michelle, I know all the boys. I've followed them since they were playing football. My boys are there now. They're 14, so it's kind of full circle. But Jeff Fiegels means a lot to me as a football player. So, John, so that's real, my I, know, story. I know we got to go, and I, I really appreciate that, Lawrence. And uh, You're welcome. Um. And, and listen, everything I did for you, I, I did it because I cared for you and I wanted you to be successful and I'm just happy you, you were. So, yeah, um, thank you. But, you know, the earplug thing was, was something really special because um, of all people way before John Carney ever got to the Giants, when I was with the Cardinals and he was with the uh, Chargers, we used to go out there in training camp. And he, he, that's what started me with the, with, with the earplugs is he started them and it took a little while to get used to them, but you know, for people that don't know the, a lot of the guys wear earplugs in the game because it quiets everything down for you, especially when you go on the road and like a place like Kansas city, you know, and the opposing kickers got to go in there and make a field goal. It's loud. So it kind of quiets loud. everything down for you. And my greatest story with head with my, with the um, earplugs was the first year, the Coughlin was a coach. We were playing the jets in preseason. I had my earplugs in and I had kicked a couple of touchbacks. And this is back before they had the Bose system where they had wireless. Well, he had the wire and he was walking down the sidelines and he couldn't get to our kicking net. He's yelling at me. I have my earplugs in. I can't hear him. He's yelling at me for kicking the ball in the end zone. <laughs> so we come out of halftime, late third quarter, I kick another one, which is very, I don't kick three touchbacks in a game. Yeah. He got Only in so the preseason. Bad. He came only in preseason. He comes running down the sideline, rips his headset off, takes the belt off where the where the cord is <laughs> oh, running down to me and gets up in my face and i i very quietly go like this what's up coach he goes <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me he looks at me with these with the you know how tom coffin looks he goes oh what the hell are those i go they're my earplugs he goes well, no wonder you haven't been hearing me. I've been yelling at you. That's for amazing. Quarters. That's the first That's time I realized story. that I wore earplugs. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah, I, I didn't hear them. I just didn't pay attention to them. So. But it's a really good tool. I encourage a lot of kids I work with, you yeah. know, heading to college, Not maybe not so much high school, but start to introduce it then. But college kids, it, it really added a whole other layer of focus to my yeah. game when I got to New York. So 100%. Man, that, and you need that as a kicker or punter. You need yep. that. <sighs> So much, club. so much more to talk about guys so much more to reminisce about let's do this again soon maybe off season and then we sure, can sure. have a, I mean, more talk about the history in the past Lawrence one more time tell the folks where they can find your podcast and anything else that you're doing yeah so Apple podcast you know it's called the blue rush pod 
Blue Rush Podcast. Um, we drop twice a week just during the season. So it's all a pro Giants podcast. We have Giants guests, past, current, former. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, tune in, give us some five-star rating. And uh, yeah, check us out. Awesome. Make sure you go check out. Of course, you can find Feagles on all of our stuff here. Big Blue Kickoff Live oh, yeah. through Friday, 1230 to 130. Guys, this was fun. Let's do it again soon, all right? Thank you, John. Yeah, man. Lawrence, good seeing you, buddy. Say hi to the family. Hey, yeah, tell Michelle I said hey. I certainly will. Thanks, guys. That's the Giants Little Podcast. You guys know where to find the, the, the Giants app, the Giants.com slash podcast and your favorite podcast platforms. For the kickers, I am Schmelk. We'll see you next time on the Giants Huddle.